Good morning. It's Joe Wiegand with Teddy Talks, 26 Days with the 26th President, coming to you from Medora, North Dakota, gateway to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, and again this summer, home to the Medora Musical and the Teddy Roosevelt Show. Today is April 7th, 2020. Uh, we'll celebrate some Teddy history uh, today. Uh, on this date in 1906, uh, in Algeciras, Spain, uh, the uh, first Algeciras uh, conference uh, concluded uh, with the signing of a document by all parties concerned. This uh, included France and Germany as the uh, two major uh, diplomatic combatants. Uh, France had negotiated a protectorate in Morocco. Germany wanted uh, to have some of that action as well. Uh, the conference was held and uh, Germany, uh, most historians uh, believe, came up on the short end of the stick, was greatly embarrassed, uh, but uh, it's one of these uh, first times where the United States stands prominently on the stage with all of the powers of Europe, uh, Russia, the Ottoman Empire further to the east, and uh, the United States Diplomatic Corps played a, a fine role in uh, helping to uh, uh, keep that peace uh, tentatively in North Africa and in Europe. I, April 7th, 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt, on his great Western tour of 22 states and two territories, more than uh, eight weeks, uh, nearly nine weeks away from the White House, touring the Western states. Uh, we've already, in this last uh, seven or eight days of uh, lessons, of, of uh, stories, we've come out via speeches in Chicago and Wisconsin and Minnesota, and uh, today, some brief remarks of Theodore Roosevelt in his beloved Medora. Uh, followed by April 7th, 1905, Theodore Roosevelt at the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. And of course, he'll reference that he had been there just some short years before, seven years prior, uh, training with Colonel Leonard Wood and the Rough Riders, the first United States Volunteer Cavalry uh, their history so closely associated with that of San Antonio. So if I may, without any further delay, keep your questions and comments coming. There were a few I dealt with online last night and we'll do so again in the uh, program and, and uh, look forward to your comments and questions. And thanks for sharing this with your family and friends, just the way we uh, appreciate sharing Medora with you. Uh, so these comments uh, here in Medora at the Old Town Hall. Uh, come on out and I'll show you where that building stood. My friends and neighbors, I am very glad to see you all. I made up my mind that come what would I would stop at Medora. I first came to Medora 20 years ago, so I am a middling old settler. I meet boys, great big strapping men and mothers of families who were children about three feet high when I knew them here. It is a very pleasant thing for me to see you. I shall not try to make you more than a very short talk because I want to have the chance to shake hands with you. Most all of you are old friends. I have stopped at your houses and shared your hospitality. With some of the men, I have ridden guard around the cattle at night worked with them in the roundup and hunted with them so that I know them pretty well. It is the greatest possible pleasure to me to come back and see how you are getting along, to see the progress made by the state, to see the progress made up at this end in the place that I know so well. And it does me good to come here and see you. There is not a human being who is more proud of what you have done and more pleased with your welfare and progress than I am. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt would uh, write as he often did from the road, and uh, he wrote of his uh, experience of his coming back to uh, Medora. And for this reminder, my uh, thanks to my good friend, the author and man of Hollywood, Michael Blake. Uh, he's coming out in June with a, a book of Theodore Roosevelt's great Western tour of 1903. And, uh, he reminded me this morning that Theodore Roosevelt uh, wrote this about his visit. They all felt I was their man, their old friend. 
and even if they had been hostile to me in the old days when we were divided by the sinister bickering and jealousies and hatreds of all frontier communities, they now finally believed they had always been my staunch friends and admirers. They had all gathered in the town hall, which was draped for a dance, young children, babies, everybody being present. I shook hands with them all, and almost each one had some memory of special association with me, which he or she wished to discuss. I only regretted I could not spend three hours with them. Medora, North Dakota. When Theodore Roosevelt mentions the progress made when he came to Western North Dakota in 1883 to hunt, 1884 and short years thereafter to ranch, and then that terrible blue winter of 86, 87, uh, the snow uh, uh, fell for 30 days, and for 30 days the temperature did not rise above zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it, when it did melt, it would refreeze, and uh, the cattle uh, died by the tens of thousands in this region, including about two-thirds of Theodore Roosevelt's herd. Uh, he would, uh, the previous winter, marry Edith uh, Kermit Carroll. And uh, that was his second wife, his first wife having died in between his first and second trips to the Badlands. And so uh, uh, as they honeymooned in Europe, word began to spread of the uh, deep winter here uh, in North Dakota. When Theodore Roosevelt returned, they briefly thought they might have to sell Sagamore Hill, uh, the new home that uh, was being completed uh, in, uh, in Oyster Bay, Long Island. But Theodore Roosevelt and, and Edith saw it through. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt did not sell his last interest in cattle here in the West until 1898. When he went to war in Cuba, uh, he uh, uh, signed off, uh, sold his last bit of ownership, uh, not uh, thinking to leave Mrs. Roosevelt, Roosevelt, his widow, with a uh, cattle investment in North Dakota if he uh, met his demise in Cuba. I was just uh, thinking statehood didn't come to North Dakota and South Dakota until 1889. So when he comes as president to speak in 1903, he's speaking to a, a state that has only been a state that has only had full representation in the Senate and the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. for uh, some uh, 14 years at that point. So April 7th, 1905, having been reelected, in November of 1904 by the largest electoral vote and popular vote plurality in our history in a contested election to that date, uh, the uh, American people uh, supporting Theodore Roosevelt uh, and his tour of the South, he uh, undertook it with a bit of trepidation. He'd gotten a tremendous amount of pushback uh, on uh, his invitation uh, to Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House. October of 1901, just weeks after becoming president. Uh, throughout the Old South, uh, the uh, newspapers and senators were uh, livid. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that uh, Theodore Roosevelt was greeted uh, so warmly uh, in the South uh, speaks well and he speaks to it. Uh, well, rather than my inarticulate bumbling, why don't we let Theodore Roosevelt have a word to say about his visit? April 7th, 1905 to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, his uh, introductory remarks to Mr. Mayor, that's Mayor John P. Campbell of San Antonio. Mr. Kirkpatrick uh, is uh, the gentleman who introduced Theodore Roosevelt to the audience. Mr. Kirkpatrick, a member of the uh, uh, Board of Aldermen uh, in San Antonio. Theodore Roosevelt, April 7th, 1905. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Kirkpatrick, and you, my fellow Americans of this mighty commonwealth, I thank you for the way in which I have been greeted today. You can hardly imagine how much it means to me to come back to San Antonio in this way and to be received as you have received me. I know that the rest of you will not grudge my saying a special word of acknowledgement to two sets among your citizens. First, to the men of the Great War, to the men who wore the blue or wore the gray in the days that tried men's souls. My fellow citizens, infinitely more important than any president, infinitely more important even than the reception to any president, is what is symbolized by seeing the men who fought in the Union Army and the men who fought in the Confederate Army standing mingled together, fellow Americans, one in devotion and honor and loyalty to the country, 
shoulder to shoulder as fellow citizens of the mightiest republic upon which the sun has ever shone. Indeed, the man who would have a poor heart, a poor spirit, who would not be thrilled by such a meeting as this, by such a sight as you accord me today, you of the gray, you of the blue, all one under the flag of this reunited country. I suppose you must know it, but I want to tell you that it was, of course, the memory of the valor, the sacrifice, the endurance you displayed in the Great War that made us of the younger generation feel that when the lesser war came, we wished to emulate your course. The regiment which I had the honor to command and which was raised and organized in this city took part in what were only skirmishes compared to the campaigns in which you did your share. And all that we claim is that while it was not given us to have the chance to do great deeds, yet we hope we made you feel that the old spirit was not altogether lost. This regiment served under men who had themselves fought in the Civil War, both under Grant and under Lee. The commander of the cavalry division was the gallant ex-Confederate soldier, Major General Joseph Wheeler, and our immediate commander, our brigade commander, was an ex-Union soldier who entered the Union Army as a private, and to whom, for my great good fortune, it befell me to sign the commission as Lieutenant General of the Army of the United States, Lieutenant General Young. Afterward, at San Juan, the cavalry served under General Sumner, from whom I took my orders. I cannot say how much it meant to me to be able to take part in raising that regiment under the shadow of the Alamo. My admiration for Texas and Texans is no new thing. Since I have been a boy and first studied the history of this country, my veins have thrilled and tingled as I read of the mighty deeds of Houston of Bowie, of Crockett, of Travis, of the men who were victorious at the fight of San Jacinto, of the even more glorious men who fell in the fight of the Alamo, of which it was said, Thermopylae had its messengers of death, but the Alamo had none. I remember so well seven years ago when we were raising this regiment, riding in here one day to see the Alamo, going away feeling that come what would, I was going to try to handle myself so that there should be no disgrace come to the memory of the Americans who died there. I want you to remember that ours was a volunteer regiment and a small war, that we do not claim any credit for what we did more than falls to the lot of any number of other people. All we ask of you is to believe that we tried to show the spirit which would have made us do the kind of a job that you of the Civil War did, if the need has ar had arisen. I wish to express my acknowledgments for the greeting which I have received here in San Antonio, and which I have received throughout the length and breadth of Texas. This is the third time I have visited this beautiful city, and it is such a beautiful city. I wonder if you yourselves, proud though you are of it, appreciate the charm it has to an outsider coming here. It is 15 years ago that I first came here, simply passing through as any number of other travelers passed through and saw it. Seven years ago when I came here, I was here strictly on business. When we got back that year from Santiago, I said to the officers of the regiment, now we have got to have a reunion of the regiment in San Antonio. All kinds of things happened in between. I have led a middling busy life myself since, and now at last the chance has come to make good the promise and to have those of the regiment who are able to come together here in the city where the regiment was raised to greet one another and talk over the past. In a sense, we claim that the regiment was a typical American body. The men composing it were raised chiefly in the Southwest, but some from the North, some from the East, so that we had the Northerner and the Southerner, the Easterner and the Westerner in that regiment. We had men in it who worshiped their creator, some according to one creed, some according to another, 
for almost every religious body of any size in the United States was represented within our ranks. We had men who had been born abroad and men who were born here, whose ancestors came to what is now the United States at the time of the landing of the first colonists at the mouth of the James or at the Plymouth. We had men of inherited wealth and men who all their lives long had earned each day's bread by that day's toil. We had men of every grade socially, men who worked with their heads, men who worked with their hands, men of all types that our country produces, but each of them glad to get in on his worth as a man only, and content to be judged purely by what he could show himself to be. It has always seemed to me that one of the greatest lessons taught by the Civil War was the lesson of brotherhood. You, my friends, who wore the blue. You, my friends, who wore the gray. What each of you, when he went forward to battle, was concerned with about the man on his right and the man on his left was not what that man's ancestry was, not as to how he worshipped his maker, not as to what his profession was or his means. What you wanted to know was whether he would stay put. If he did, you were for him, and if he did not, you were against him. The same thing that was true in the Great War is true in time of peace. This government is emphatically a government by the people, for the people, of the people. Now, besides applauding that sentiment, let us live up to it. It has two sides to it. In the first place, it applies in a dozen different directions. It applies, for instance, in reference to creed. We have a right to ask that our neighbor do his duty toward God and man, but we have no business to dictate to him how he shall worship his maker, and no business to discriminate for or against him because of the way in which he does it. In the same way, if a man is a decent citizen, he is a decent citizen whether rich or poor. To judge from some of the talk you occasionally hear, a man cannot be a square man if he is rich. Remember always that you listen at your peril to any man who would seek to inflame you against your fellow citizen because he is better off. Again in the Civil War, come back to the consideration about your bunkie. You did not care whether he was a banker or a bricklayer. If he was a banker, he was all right if he was a good fellow, if he did his duty in camp, if he did not struggle on the march, if he did not drop his share of the joint provisions on the march, and then expect you to share yours with him at the end of the day. You wanted him to do his part, and if he did it, you were for him. Now apply that in civil life. If the rich man does not his duty, cinch him, and I will help you just as far as I can. But don't cinch him because he is a rich man. If you do, you are a mighty mean creature yourself. You are not a good American yourself. Give him a perfectly fair show. If he is a poor man and does his duty, help him, stand by him. If he whines about his poverty and says that he ought to be carried, you may just as well make up your mind to drop him then and there. Every man of us stumbles at times. Every man of us at times needs a helping hand stretched out to him. And shame to any man who will not stretch out that helping hand to his brother if that brother needs it. But if the brother lies down, you can do mighty little in carrying him. You can help him up. But once up, he has got to walk himself. The only way in which you can ever really help any man is to help him to help himself. That brings me to the second set of people here, whom I have been most especially glad to see and to greet the children. The first place I believe in them, as you know, and judging by the showing that San Antonio has made today, San Antonio is all right as regards both quality and quantity of your children. As I like your stock, I am glad that it does not seem likely to die out. In passing through Texas, I have been more impressed than by anything else by the evident care you are giving to education, the evident care given to training your children, the school facilities, both for primary and higher education. 
and the way in which those facilities are being taken advantage of. Of course, it is a mere truism to say that the care of the children is the most important task of any generation. You have a wonderful empire here in Texas. It is literally larger than most old world empires. Your diversification of soil and climate, the marvelous fertility of your soil, your natural advantages, ensure you a phenomenal future agriculturally and industrially. Ensure this state a wonderful growth in population and wealth. All that is essential. You must have the material basis upon which to build as a foundation. But I need not say to you to remember that it is only a foundation. The material counts for nothing if you do not build upon it the spiritual, if you do not build upon it the things of the soul, of the mind. Let me again take an example from the war. We need arms and equipment, but the best rifle ever made does not make a soldier if it has not got the right man behind it. You may take the finest modern weapon, put it in the hands of a weakling or a coward, and a good man will beat him with a club. If the other man is a good man too, you want a mighty good weapon, or you will be getting beaten. But the weapon does not in any shape or way serve as a substitute for the spirit of the soldier. That is what counts in the last resort. Tactics change, weapons change, but the soul that drives a man forward to victory does not change as the ages go by. The men of the Civil War, alike the men who wore the gray and the men who wore the blue, made a record which remains forever a heritage of honor and of glory for all this people. They did that because they had in them the spirit which from time immemorial has made the soldiers of whom the world is proud the spirit for the lack of which no other quality in man or in nation will atone. We of today, we who, if a war should come, will have to fight under new conditions, with new arms, will win, as assuredly I believe we shall win, only because our men still have in them the spirit that made their forefathers do well in battle. So you must train your children up, so that in addition to having what counts for material prosperity in a state, you must have the things that tell most for greatness, the things that make for the soul of the nation. Here in San Antonio, what is the building you are proudest of? The Alamo. It is not exactly up to date. Other buildings are more useful, but you are proud of it because it commemorates forever the spirit of those who made its fame immortal. So in the state itself, important though it is to provide for the industrial welfare of the Commonwealth, the thing that is most important is to take care of the really vital crop, the crop of citizens. The thing which the state most needs to care for is the welfare, not mer merely material, but moral and intellectual as well, of the children who are going to make up the state 15, 20, or 25 years hence. And that is why I am glad to see the care which you of Texas are taking in the training of the generation that is now coming up. A thing that is distressing to me uh, to see is when sometimes the man and woman who have done well in life show a curious inability to train their own children in the way that has resulted sex successfully for themselves. I think that all of us know people who, because they have worked hard and triumphed, feel that somehow or other they will spare their children the acquisition of the very qualities which have made the parents triumph. Too often you see the man, and I am sorry to say the woman, who says, I have had to work hard. My sons and my daughters shall have an easy time. Such a man or woman is preparing ruin for the children about whom this is said. Of course, you want to give your children all the love possible, but it is not right to mistake folly for affection. When you spare the child that which alone will enable it to conquer in afterlife, you are not giving it a blessing. You are doing it the greatest wrong in your power. Bring up the boy and the girl alike with the understanding that life is not generally soft, is not generally easy, that there will be plenty of rough times, 
and that what they have to show is not the spirit that avoids difficulties and flinches from them, but the spirit which overcomes them. Let each of the older among you look back upon your lives. You men of the Civil War, what are the times of which you are proudest? What are the memories you are most glad to hand down to your children and your children's children? The times that were easy? No. You are proud to remember and have them rem remember the days of toil, of peril, of effort. The days when you had to risk life and endure every form of hardship and of labor, when you had in you the spirit that made you endure it, that made you rise level to the great need. Surely you must not rob your sons of the right to feel in their turn the same pride that you now feel in the power to overcome difficulty, the power to work, the power of wrestling triumph out of danger. There is only one of my fellow citizens to whom I will touch my hat quicker than to the soldier, and that is the mother, because I think she has a little harder time of it. The mother who has brought up as they should be brought up a family of young children is entitled to such respect as no other person in the community is entitled to. When the end of her life comes, she has endured any amount of hardship, uh, the sitting up by beds of sick children, the endless taking care of them, for a mother is not allowed to know the difference between night and day as far as the ending of the day's task is concerned. But after all, when her life is done, she can look back upon it with a prouder sense of satisfaction than anyone else. If she has done her duty for her children and her husband, they shall rise up and call her blessed. The worthy life for the nation, for the individual, for the man, for the woman, is the life of effort for the things worth striving for. And our whole aim should be not to teach those who are to come after us to shirk difficulties, to strive to have an easy time in life, but to strive to do their duty, whether that duty is hard or not, and to feel that no success is so great as the success of duty worth doing, which is well done. Of course, that is my conception of the life for the nation as well as for the individual. I am not going to develop my theory about that. In the first place, because I want to keep clear of anything that you might think touched in the faintest degree upon politics. And in the next place, because I believe you know pretty well how I feel anyway. I feel that this nation, whether it wishes to or not, cannot help being a great nation. You of Texas, by what your forefathers did and what you have done, have helped in making this nation so that it is not impossible not to be great. We cannot decide whether we will be great or not. The only thing we can decide is whether being great, we will do well or do ill. We have got our duty in the world. We must do our duty to others, and we must do our duty to ourselves. We must so handle ourselves that no weak power which is behaving itself shall have cause to fear us, and no strong power of any kind shall be able to oppress or wrong us. We all believe in the Monroe Doctrine. I have a little difficulty in getting some of my friends to accept my interpretation of it, but they will in time, because that interpretation has come to stay. We are building the Panama Canal. While that will be a benefit to all the country, it will be of most benefit to the Gulf states. We have duties in connection with the great position we have taken. We cannot shirk these duties. We can do them well or do them ill, but do them we must. That is one reason why I want to see a good Navy, and we have got a good Navy. I am going to use a simile that I used a couple of nights ago at Dallas. In the old days in Texas, I understand that there used to be a proverb that while you would not generally want a gun at all, if you did want it, you wanted it quick and you wanted it awfully bad. That is just the way I feel about the Navy. I feel that if we have it, the chances are that we will not need it, but that if we do not have it, we might find that our need for it was vital. 
That's Teddy Talks for April 7th, 2020, coming uh, to you from Medora, North Dakota. I'll wrap it up quickly here today and look forward to seeing you tomorrow on April 8th. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to have a message from a, a New Yorker in South Carolina. This is Theodore Roosevelt's April 8th and uh, some April 9th comments from Charleston, South Carolina, the great exposition held there. Uh, April 9th, uh, a young Theodore Roosevelt, 1883, uh, the young assemblyman in New York. I believe this is on social service reform. Uh, his speech of that day, April 9th, that'll be a brief program. April 10th, a longer program, The Strenuous Life. We know that phrase from Theodore Roosevelt, The Strenuous Life. Well, this is the speech he made in Chicago to the Hamilton Society on April 10th, 1899, serving as governor of New York. And we'll wrap up on Saturday with a briefer program. April 11th, the University of Michigan from that same year, 1899. About time we got the Wolverine State in. Uh, I'm uh, disappointed that the uh, current conditions have forced me to postpone uh, an appearance for the South Haven Performing Arts Center in South Haven, Michigan. Uh, one of the six states that voted for Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Uh, I shall return. That was Douglas MacArthur, but I shall return to Michigan. We're still going to hunt, hike portions of the North Country Trail, celebrating the 40th anniversary of that trail that starts at Lake Champlain and uh, ends at Lake Sakakawea at uh, uh, Lake Sakakawea State Park in North Dakota. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you here in North Dakota. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Teddy Talks, 26 days with the 26th president. Uh, hoping we can all get through April. Uh, we give thanks. You're in my prayers. Godspeed. God bless America.